Welcome, everybody. Hope you can hear me okay. My name is Tim Bascom, and um, I'm the director of the Kansas Book Festival. And I'm going to just say a word first because we're co hosting this event, and then uh, Kathleen, the bishop, will be addressing you as well. This year, um, we are very enthused about having this opportunity to co sponsor having Eliza Griswold with us. And I can't help but first make a little announcement um, because it's an opportunity to do that. The Kansas Book Festival has existed for 10 years, and uh, we'll be having our 10th anniversary on September 18th, a Saturday. And you're welcome to come to Washburn University, where we'll be having about 50 authors who are coming with connections, many of them to Kansas itself. And um, we're doing a couple of things different this year, and one of them is uh, helping out with this event with Eliza Griswold speaking. Um, we're also having two other pre-festival events that I just wanted to let you know about. One of them is Nancy Bristow, an author with a book called uh, The American Pandemic. She'll be uh, speaking on September 15th, which is a Wednesday, right before the festival. And that's uh, because of our collaboration with Washburn University, where it will be occurring. And uh, she'll be talking about that pandemic, which is the 1918 flu epidemic, um, and making comparisons to what we're dealing with today under these circumstances. Also, Rebecca Tossig will be coming and speaking at the Maybe Library at Washburn University. And Rebecca has a beautiful new memoir out called Sitting Pretty that is about being raised in a wheelchair. And uh, she lives in Kansas City uh, and won the Hefner Heights Kansas Book Award this year. So come to that if you can on September 17th. If you want more details, just go to the Kansas Book Festival um, website. Roundtable Bookstore is representing the books today that you could order uh, or purchase. We had a, a problem. They were trying to get books in, and there was a shipping issue, and they were not able to get the full shipment in, so there's only a few of the books out there. First come, first serve. Don't stampede. But when you're going out, um, there are books there, and you can also uh, get your name down to have one actually delivered for free to you or you could pick it up from Roundtable Books, which is in Noto, in the North Topeka area. So I'm going to introduce Eliza just a bit, uh, trying to let her own words speak to you, and then the bishop will be coming up uh, to say something about the Toker Lecture, which is, this is part of a longer tradition of lectures here. Eliza will be speaking to you, I'm sure, a bit about um, her work in Af Afghanistan. Uh, she was there um, going back to 2010 to 14 in those years, I would think, maybe even further back. 2003 even, as early as that, back and forth. And she became fascinated with um, some poems that were being written by women called Land Days. I hope I'm saying it correctly. And these poems um, are a little bit, maybe you could compare them to haiku. Uh, they have 22 syllables. There's nine in the first line, 13 in the second. And it's very unusual for women to be writing poetry in Afghanistan due to some of the restric restrictive uh, doctrines there. And she, Eliza, had learned about a young woman who was quite adept at it in a woman's group that were sharing these who suddenly was beaten up by her brothers for having written such poetry. She then burnt herself um, so badly that she ended up dying. And Eliza went into Afghanistan to uh, learn about her in particular, but other poets who were doing this kind of work and started gathering them and translating them 
which became a book called I Am the Beggar of the World, which is one of these books that I highly recommend you purchase if you can. I'm going to just read you a couple of these so that you get a flavor for what these women were writing. You sold me to an old man, Father. May God destroy your home. I was your daughter. My love is a suicide bomber who stalks the home of my heart and waits to attack. Your eyes aren't eyes, they're bees. I can find no cure for their sting. Because my love's American, blisters blossom on my heart. So it's very prophetic that Eliza, all the way back then, was collecting these and starting to realize the relationship that was developing between some of these young women or older women who were writing and the United States. In her uh, preface to the book, she said, each biting word change, and these, these, these poems were evolving over time, has much to teach about the social satire fueled by resentment that ripples under the surface of a woman's life. With the drawdown of American forces in 2014 looming, these are the voices of protest most at risk when the Americans pull out. And that was in 2014. She wrote her own poem in another collection that uh, you might want to take a look at called If Men Then, and this poem is called Pulling Out. Exodus is a traffic jam, and traffic jams are dangerous. Ahead of us, armed with sticks and rakes, a child's brigade does battle on this doomed track hourly blown to dust. To occupy themselves, they race a tank. Dust is faster. Tattered surveillance blimps yank against steel tethers over the salt lick plain. The road goes boom again. The flimsy means by which we try to distance war don't matter anymore. Disguise your car, your hair, take to the air, stare down on the terrible mirror of the ground where those who didn't qualify for tickets to the sky wave goodbye, goodbye. So we almost didn't get Eliza here because she was very busy the last uh, week um, trying to bring actual Afghan people out of Afghanistan. And uh, she'll speak to you more about that, but there were four chartered planes that she was able to arrange and lots of people coming out due to her work with a few other people. I would describe her as a poet of social witness in the tradition of poets such as Carolyn Forche, who wrote a, a poem that some of you may know about a colonel in El Salvador, a ruthless man during the Civil War of 1978, who tries to intimidate her by spilling out a bag of human ears on a desk. That social witness sensibility means that she's also a first-rate journalist, as Forche was. And she has a book called The Tenth Parallel, that was a notable book of the year from the New York Times. It, she reported there on the fault line between Islam and Christianity around the world. And she was traveling for, I think, about seven years, back and forth to countries like Nigeria, Sudan, Somalia, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines. Not easy places to be. She also wrote a book called Amity and Prosperity, which won a Pulitzer Prize and for a number of years was actually constantly in contact with one family that was being terribly damaged by fracking that was happening in Pennsylvania. And now she writes regularly for The New Yorker on religion and politics, covering subjects like an evangelical woman author at Baylor University who's bucking back against the concept of complementarianism, putting women in one role, men in the other, and usually with the men having the power. 
or looking at the Southern Baptist Convention and its struggles around race. These are some of the things that she's been doing, and I'm just going to end by saying that uh, it's being noticed and it's making a difference, and there are other authors who speak uh, in a very admiring way about her work. Catherine Boo is one of those who some of you may have read in a book called Behind the Beautiful Forevers, and in that book, which is a National Book Award winner, um, or that author has said, riveting and outraging this book that she had written, Amity and Prosperity, an essential account of corporate wrangling and citizen resistance in an unequal age. So let's uh, welcome Kathleen to say a word about the Toker lecture, and then we'll be hearing from Eliza. Thank you, Tim. I mainly want to simply add my welcome uh, to Eliza Griswold uh, for, for really going above and beyond to get here um, with all that she has been doing. Um, uh, actions often speak louder than words, and uh, her actions of late are of incredible meaning and importance. So. It is, it is a joy for uh, the Episcopal Diocese of Kansas to join with the Kansas Book Festival for this event. For decades, um, the Episcopal Church in Kansas has sought uh, the education of transformative leaders for church and society. Uh, the Toker Lecture began in 1984 and with an intention of theological engagement with the complexities of their times, their time and their place. I hope that tonight is about transformation. The living word speaks change, change so deep that nothing will ever be the same change that encompasses what happens in the lives of each of us as individuals, but also within the whole of our communities. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And I think what's really interesting there is that that's not individual in that passage, it is more collective, that we are to be transformed. Um, I have been deeply moved, uh, especially by uh, the work that Eliza did in Amity and Prosperity, as one in Kansas who cares deeply about water, air, grasslands. Um, this book is extraordinary in how it does move into an issue that divides people and calls for transformation. So again, it is a pleasure. Um, Eliza Griswold's father was the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, and he ordained me priest in the Diocese of Chicago. That's just a little personal thank you, so please, uh, please know that. And we welcome Eliza Griswold. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me okay? Thank you so much, Tim and Kathleen. I have to say, when this invitation arrived, things sometimes reached me a little sideways, and I was like, hang on a second. The Episcopal Church and the Book Festival? Like, how are these? This is my life. Like, how are these two forces coming together? So I want to say thank you so much. I'm, and the, just the generosity of this invitation. I want to thank the Book Festival in general as well as Grace Cathedral. Just, you guys have just been tremendous. You know, I mean, about five days ago, I've been working on moving people, and I'll explain that a little bit, but I just looked at these little buses moving around Kabul, around the capital of Afghanistan, 
And I knew that I could not leave those buses. I could not leave those buses until those people got into the airport. And it was, it was Thursday, maybe it was last Wednesday. It was Wednesday. And I could see that in order to make it here, I had to first go to Dayton, Tennessee. Yeah, and that's how I was getting here. And the buses didn't move, and the buses didn't move. So finally, I called the people in Tennessee, and I said, I'm sorry, I'm not coming. I can't make it. I can't leave these buses. And one of my <laughs> friends said to me, listen, if those people are really Christian, they will understand. <laughs> so then, then the next call, I went and made, let it wait a little bit, and I thought, well, if I don't even have a ticket there anymore, how am I going to make it to Topeka? And I canceled and said, I can't, I'll do it. Please, I'll do it virtually. And then my husband came in, and, and I said, I just canceled. And he looked at me with consternation. He said, but you really wanted to go. And I said, yeah, I really did. And he said, let's see how we can figure that out. So my sister booked the ticket because I was still on the buses. So my sister got with her credit card, booked my flight here, <laughs> figured it out, uh, and here I am. So I'm so grateful. Um, and those... No, and those buses made it into the airport, and now, guess what? There are always going to be more buses, and that is part of what I am trying to come to terms with, as so many of us are. So there's so many things I could talk to you guys tonight about talking across lines, and the way that that works for me, it's a lot of what I do as a journalist. I spend a lot of time it, with people who are politically probably, I, I write for the bubble, I live in the bubble, but I don't do a lot of reporting inside the bubble. Um, and it is humbling and expansive every time that I venture out into the world of diverse opinions. I want to restore that word when we talk about people who are different than we are. Why don't we use diversity when we're talking about politics or belief? Diversity is a code word for what we, a kind of difference we hold up as special. But people can't think differently than we do. That's not diversity. So I am trying to talk about diverse audiences. Diverse audiences mean people who believe different things. And we've been talking a lot about that a lot today. One of the humbling things about growing up at the kitchen table of my parents is, you know, we had a lot of stinky monks and orthodox hoo-hahs coming to dinner at that butcher block table all the time, right? I mean, people who just like, who, the who were they? You know, one of my dad's best friends was a cloistered nun named Sister Pia. We'd go visit Sister Pia through the grate. I've never met Sister Pia through, not through a grate, right? But why can't she be your best friend? Like, that's just how that goes. Um, and, and I think some of those experiences, talking today about liminality, right? When I got, I was terrified growing up of God's will because very early on, my dad said to my sister and I, offhandedly, thinking he was paying us a great compliment, I think one of you is going to be a nun. And from that on, it was a race to get as far away from nunnery as you could imagine, right? And I saw my parents making these tremendous sacrifices um, for, for the greater good, as they understood it. And I was terrified that the way that God works in one's life is that God is going to ask you to do the last thing that you want to do. Because what could be more proof of surrender and faith than doing the thing that your will does not want to do? So a lot of my early childhood was like deliberately trying not to listen to God and into adolescence as well. Just no way, man, I am going to be the center of this whatever is the most normal thing, I'm going for that. I am afraid of the edges. I'm not going to those liminal spaces. But that's not how life works. Um, and so when I got into college and became acquainted with the work of the theologian Mercia Iliade, who ended up becoming a fascist, but we'll just talk about early work, um, and this concept of liminality, right? This concept of what is hierophanic space? What is, what is a hierophany? Standing here would be a hierophany. Where is it where the secular, horizontal, everyday world, the access meets the vertical, meets ultimate concern, if we're going to talk about 
Tillich, right? Like, so I got a lot of these ideas early on. They made a crazy mishmash in my head. Um, I was invited to doubt, you know, like my, I'm gonna talk, I don't usually talk very much about my dad, but I, he's 83 now and I love him so much. And in this space, it's hard not to, but you know, you guys will know, like most of the people in the world, when you say that you are the child of like a high mucky muck in a church, they think that dude is like conservative and blah, blah, blah. You know, my dad got up at 5.30 every morning to do yoga on a sheepskin rug. Like his first spiritual experience was with Native Americans sleeping in the back of a truck. Like he, he is out there, you know, he is, he is, he is a liminal cat, you know. Um, he doesn't look like it, but he is. And so the invitation to me from childhood, when I could find the courage to take it, was to, to uh, encounter liminal spaces and liminal people because meaning lies at the edge. Meaning lies at the edge, and it's dangerous out there because that is not, it is not safe on a border. That is a dangerous place to be. Um, it's porous and it's a space of great meaning, and it's a space where I have encountered, I would say, I don't really, I, see, you can hear this is my own spiritual journey. It's where I've encountered the greatest meaning, and it's where I try to speak to people from. And so for me, this work in Afghanistan is probably the most meaning, it is the most meaningful space that I've been like this. So I'm gonna take tonight to talk to you guys a little bit about Afghanistan, um, but as I'm talking, you know, I mean, as Kathleen was saying, the liminal space I've just spent seven years in is Appalachia. You know, where, where are these spaces of in-between that are porous, that are dangerous, that are angry, that are vulnerable, where we have exacted some of our worst behavior as humans? Who pays for that? Mostly liminal people, marginal people pay for that. So to scroll back for a second, how did I become involved in Afghanistan? I am part of a whole generation of foreign correspondents who came of age around 9-11. Um, I had done my first story as a journalist, oh goodness, probably in Uganda just before 9-11. And I had done that story um, for the London Sunday Times Magazine. Who even knew this thing existed? It says, walking with my sister in Central Park the morning of 9-11, and you guys all know we're a few days away from the 20th anniversary, right? Um, I was walking with my sister in Central Park. Boom, the towers are hit. Um, I was in my late 20s, I think. I can't even remember, but I called my, the London Sunday Times. I'd worked for them once, and I said, I'm here in New York. Can I help you? And they said, get down there as quickly as you can. And two weeks later, I was in Pakistan with those same sneakers, with the dust of the trade centers in the refugee camps where the Taliban was born along that border in Pakistan. And I became very, very involved very quickly with a group, with a, with a ethnic group that, that the Taliban comes from, the Pashtun people. There are about 23 to 25 million Pashtuns, both on the Pakistan side of the border and the Afghanistan side. They're, they, they, the sh blue shuttlecock burqa that we think of as an Afghan woman is a Pashtun cultural symbol. And the culture is amazing and completely, it's just like they follow a code called Pashtun Wali, uh, which is very heavily influenced still by blood feuds. So, you know, cousins go cousins. There's a, real, a whole sort of almost Byzantine reality to life. There's also a huge code of hospitality, so that if somebody comes to your house and they are your guest, you protect them to the point of death. I'm not gonna talk this evening about some of those experiences that I had with the Pashtun people early on. I made a friend who is a Pashtun spitfire, um, and she took me to her village, and I had a couple of run-ins with the Taliban and ended up um, being detained by military intelligence, gun to the head, handcuffs, blindfolded, all of that. But that story, although that is part of my experience in Afghanistan and Pakistan along this border, I'm not gonna talk about this too much. I'm gonna focus more on the women um, who I have met and where they are now. So there's a kind of, so Pashtun 
women, like one of the reasons that I wrote this book, that I collected these, cult, these poems called Landes, which have, are, they're millennia old, they're pre-Islamic. Like when we think about the literary tradition of these poems, we think they're probably related to the Indo-Aryan caravans that move throughout the region. So like they're, they're couplets, so they're related to the, uh, the Vedas, the, the slokas, the, the couplets in the 5,000-year-old the Hindu holy texts, right? Like, okay, that's probably their, their kind of jam. That's where they come from. So in them, the subjects that they take on are nomadic subjects because the thinking is that they were used by caravans as a form of communication, as a call and response, right? And I can't say call and response within a church without hearing somebody say antiphonally from side to side, right? So, so you have one side, you have, it, they, they, they echo themselves within the, the body. So I would, like an example might have been like, if you're calling to the back of a caravan and you want to make sure that your message reaches there, you might say, you know, hey, we're going to turn right when we reach the next big pile of sand. And then you, that's the first line and the next line comes back at you. Okay, we hear you, next pile of sand. So they, they speak inside themselves to one another. So again, they're millennia old. They below, they're, a, they're, a cult, they're a folk tradition. They're not written. They're mouth to mouth, ear to ear over millennia. And they are solely the voices of women. So get your head around that for a minute. We're talking about women who are silenced by the culture in with which they're, they live, and yet, there's a secret language going on that they share around weddings, when they're working in the fields, they pass these poems around. And the poems are phenomenally angry, sexy, bawdy, gross, grief stick stricken. There's a kind of grief. Uh, it's a mixture of grief and rage that belongs only to a Pashtun woman and it's called a kham. That's how you translate it. And basically, it is the understanding that of a Pashtun woman that she lives in a state of ham. She lives just basically betrayed by the, by the condition of her world. What humbled me about this, and the reason that I wanted to collect these poems, is that I was so tired after, I, I've been in Afghanistan, I think, so I was in, uh, in the tribal area on that border in 2001, on October 7th, when the US started bombing. Uh, but I don't think I ever went inside Afghanistan until 2003. And just as the rest of us, I had spent, you know, a decade reading journalism through the eyes of the journalists who, with all well-meaning, had gone out to tell certain stories about people and the conditions of their lives. But what I was missing, and, and I have a friend who's a photographer who's a very sensitive soul poet, um, what we were both missing is where are the voices of these people themselves, unmitigated. When, a, when an Afghan woman looks out at the world, what is she looking at? Not what does it look like when we look at her, right? And what I realized as I began to collect these poems was that my facile idea of that an Afghan woman was a mute blue ghost under a burqa and that I understood the conditions of her subjugation better than she herself understood was a dangerous fiction, okay? So we've been talking a lot today about our sort of favorite moments that bring us, bring us out of the illusion of difference, right? And for me as a journalist, when I hit things I'd get wrong, my assumptions, I love that. Because when, that ex when I can explode an assumption, I drop deeper into what's really going on. There's less crap. It's not like I think I know what's going on, but I certainly know I'm wrong. I'd better shut up for another seven years and sit here, right? So Tim told a little bit about how we got started with collecting these poems. Um, we found a, a secret literary society in Afghanistan called Mirman Bahir. There are lots of these. And it's a group of women who, until two weeks ago, met openly in the capital of Kabul. We're talking about professors, you know, women wearing high heels, lipstick. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not wearing burqas. They're professors. And in each of Afghanistan's 34 provinces, they have a secret presence. 
So the way they do that is there's tons of radio in Afghanistan. So these women will go on like local radio shows and they have what's called a poetry, they don't call it this, I, I called it this, but a poetry hotline. They have a mobile phone number where you can actually call, young girls call, I keep using the present tense, this is not happening anymore. Um, girls call and they read their own poems. And um, it's hard for us to think about poetry as that important. It's not important in our society. It's hugely important in Pashtun society. And it's also when girls can't go to school, which has been happening for a long time in, in rural places, which we don't hear about. Um, uh, when girls can't go to school, poetry becomes a way, that's a way for them to continue their education. So these, these professional women in Afghanistan have a huge network of girls they know who are living in the provinces who call in and kind of secretly read their poems. And one of these young women who had called in many times, um, she would call and read her poems and what happened is her brothers overheard her reading them and they misunderstood that she was calling a boy um, and they threatened to kill her. They, they beat her up a couple of times pretty badly and she did what Afghan women do as a really perverse form of self-determination and she set herself on fire because that was the one form of agency she had was to end her own life. So I learned about this girl through the, the network of the professional women who survived her. And the one poem that had survived her, because I, I made it to the rural place where she lived, it, under Taliban control at this point, about 10 years ago, Taliban already owned this area. You know, when I go to places like that, I wear a GPS tracker, right? So that if I'm nabbed for a number of hours, somebody can see my coordinates, because it's on my clothes. Um, so I, and this, my wonderful team, um, we talked to her family and the parents denied that being a poet, because it has to do with art in Afghanistan, can be seen as, it's akin to being a prostitute, to be honest, dancing, singing, all out. Um, certainly that's how it is under the Taliban. So they denied, oh, she wasn't a poet. Then one aunt kind of fessed up to, this is exactly right. And her father burned all her notebooks and the one poem that survived her was one of these Land Day poems because she didn't own it, right? It's in, it's in the collective consciousness. So she repeated it a lot, the women knew it, everybody knows this poem, and it's the first poem in the collection. And it goes like this, it's just two lines, so it's, I call your stone, one day you'll look and I'll be gone. And for me now, at this time, understanding what we have left behind, what we're leaving behind right now, our responsibility, my responsibility as a journalist for decades to show up and help women spin a fiction of what their life might be, right? Sure, be a radio disc jockey, you're gonna be a journalist. Sure, let me help this program that gets you out of the house to learn to do X, Y, and Z because this is the new world, baby. This is what's coming for you to come to terms with the fact that that, that everything I put down on a paper that has a name on it is now a threat to those who are there is almost impossible for me to come to terms with. There are two specific people as a result of these poems who I have specific debt to. Their names are Zarmina and Gulistan. Zarmina because of translating these poems, it wasn't, this is where Afghanistan, you've got to kind of roll with it a little bit. It wasn't the poems themselves, it was working with Westerners. She translated for me and some others. The Taliban sentenced her to death. Now, it's quite common to get uh, a threat from the Taliban. It's called a night letter, they post it to your gate. This was different. This was a letter on Taliban letterhead. I've never seen anything like it that said, you, Zarmina Wahidi, you have been sentenced to death by the Taliban. We have already dispatched the angel of death. This is just to let you know this is an Islamic decision. There's no, you know, that's it. That was what the letter said. This was probably 2017, 
it was a little bit after this work came out, we were able to get her out of Afghanistan very quickly to India. Um, now, this is another of those moments that's like completely humbling because Zarmina, Zarmina loves to shop, okay? Zarmina, is, she's so much fun. She's very frivolous. And every day you're like, Zarmina, pull it together, okay? Like, pull it together. Like, this is very serious. And she's like, oh, darling, you're fine. Let's go, let's go look at dresses. And I'm like, okay. So one of the things she loved to shop for was gold. Now, Zarmina has a very particular life story, which is she grew up, her father was killed during the Soviet occupation. So she is the breadwinner. There's no man in her household to say no to Zarmina, right? Zarmina became weirdly a, a radio star at a very early age because they have like soap operas on the radio. She became a star of a show called Wadan, which is like my homeland. So she would travel around to record this show. No one knew who she was because she, she, they couldn't see her. They could just hear her. So she has this, she's like a celebrity, but a secret celebrity. Anyway, we would go to the market. She would buy all this gold and I would judge, judge, judge like, oh, she has no idea the suffering in this country. What is she doing? Wrong. The second she was sentenced to death, she put all that gold on, dressed up like a bride, because that's what brides do, and left the country, right? And it was just another of those moments where I was like, I know nothing. My self-righteousness, my understanding of what matters and what doesn't is upside down, right? So Zarmina went, Eventually, we got Zarmina to Virginia, where she lives now with her three little girls and her awesome husband. But she wasn't the only one under that death sentence. The rest of her family was sentenced as well because of their relationship to her. We've been trying to get them out for two years, three years. Um, and then last week happened. And it was like, guess what? The Taliban, who's been held 200 miles away at bay in Pakistan and has not been able to get your family because they live in this bobble, they're they're coming now. You need to leave now. We got her 11 family members onto a bus. We got them to the airport with 140 other people. We begged and pleaded, and Ashley, one of my friends in this endeavor, called the White House, because she has some friends there, explained what was happening. I'll go into this in a little bit of detail. We basically crashed through the door, uh, the gate of, the, of that Kabul airport, and we're able to get that first 140 and now more than 1,000 people off the ground. Um, please don't clap. Please don't clap. There's so many millions of people who are left behind. Um, so the other family is the other translator of this work, Gulistan. I'm not going to use his last name. He's so Gulistan. Gulistan had a different story. He's a big BBC journalist, and he's not in Afghanistan anymore. Um, but his family comes from a like crazy Taliban area where Taliban's have been in control for a long time. Um, and then ISIS took over, and in 2019, ISIS killed his father, murdered him because Gulistan was a journalist, and they knew that international journalist. But because the state functioned in some degree in 2019. Actually, those ISIS men were caught, and they were put in prison at Bagram Air Base um, in Kabul. Ten days ago now, maybe seven, there was a jailbreak. They got out. The first call they made were to Gulistan's two brothers. We're coming for you. Gulistan, is, that's a family of 14 there. The, the, the two brothers have passports, but their newborns don't have passports. They, too, they are today, they are they landed in Washington yesterday, and now I think they're on their way to Wisconsin. But those are people who would be killed right now, like right now, like not like theoretical. And I tell you those stories to try to give a little bit of a sense of like, who are these people? What are our obligations to these people as Americans, right? The, they translated some poetry, right? They also, both of them translated for the U.S. military at different times. They did the work that was presented to them. There's an entire generation of at least two million Afghans who have no concept of what the Taliban is, who are like as if they're, grow they're in South Bend growing up, right? They have the internet, they have movies. What is going to happen to them? It is beyond imagining. So that's the first part. And 
And to, to say what I'm doing right now is to make clear to you where, somebody asked me today, where is the hope? Because this is devastating to the point of like, I actually don't, I cannot get my head around. I can't, I just can't understand so many pieces of how this has gone down this way. Um, and I don't even want to talk about that. I'm not qualified to talk about it. I don't want to talk about that. Um, but what's happened is that I'm standing here talking to you guys. There are probably a hundred of me, people who have worked there for a really long time, who scrambled and got together with friends, who raised enormous, we raised, me and my two friends, we raised to date $2 million to charter a plane that cost $1.5 million to get people at, moving and out of the country, right? How did we do that? We created two foundations within 12 hours so people could give this money. I've had phone calls from celebrities. Like, my phone rings and it's people like whose names we all know, and I'm like, I'm too busy to talk to you. How much are you giving? I told my own mother today not to let Episcopal Relief and Development call me unless they were ready to give $100,000 or more, okay? Just to be totally transparent. So, and, and it is not, and what I am doing, many people are doing, right? You guys have seen these, these like, like who, who, one of my partners in this is an interior decorator who deals in Afghan carpets, okay? Like, this is how ordinary Americans are doing extraordinary things on behalf of people we love and have relationships with and obligations to. And what is more American than that? You know, we, ha we do have ingenuity, we do have loyalty, and we do show up. So that's just a little bit of like color. I don't think I'm gonna get into too much of the details because I'm not sure yet my boss, I called my boss, David Remnick at The New Yorker, and I told him I wanted a $500,000 to get people out of Afghanistan, who we as the New Yorker have like tertiary responsibilities to, okay? We gathered all our reporters, because what I know as a woman, what the men don't know, is that that guy, their, their translator, their fixer, their driver, has two wives and 10 kids. And why do I know that? Because culturally, I go meet them. That's how it goes, right? They take me to their houses, I know their kids, I get pictures, of, like, I know who they are because by virtue of my own cultural identity. I don't think the New Yorker would say this publicly because the, one of the grossest things, and I'm sure you guys have seen this, is this kind of chest beating of like news organizations who get their people out. Those stories make me sick. Like why in the hell, great, you got your 10 people out. There are 10 million people behind, right? So it's not something I, I, we're going to talk too much publicly about, but we did get this group of people out, and I have watched. I've kept my boss up every two hours for five days. I've watched him write, and a couple of other people like him, emails into the void of like the head of the CIA being like, we have children outside of the airport who are going to be killed in the next 45 minutes if you don't respond, right? Like, just extraordinary measures. And the other thing is, it's not just civilians. There was a wonderful man at dinner, a, a veteran, yeah? Is, I think I'm looking at him, yeah. The people who have come forward in this extraordinary circumstance are our veterans. They are the people we have put in harm's way for years, for decades, and now they have to clean up this extraordinary mess. I wor am working really closely with a bunch of Navy SEALs, a bunch of CIA operatives, people who aren't normally, uh, don't drop into my email and say who they are. Because we are, are getting people out together. It, it, it's really the veterans, I just wanna say. Like, the man who's driving, he doesn't do the driving himself. The man who's coordinating the buses that we need to get to the airport, he's a former special operations person who moves, he, today he moves 600 people into to position to try to get them out. The pilot who's flying these guys out for us, another spe former special operations guy who's a doctor, who's running all the COVID vaccines for the entire U.S. mission right now at the same time. The, the, I, I wish I could tell you this story. There's somebody who works in what we call other go government agencies who I watched nearly get fired the other night because she sent a, a rescue team out to get some Afghans who were in a really 
they were community college students from freaking Sacramento and they'd gotten themselves into a bad position and she risked her 30-year career to make sure that they were safely brought inside a base. So this is happening like the head of Sesame Street. I mean, you, the partners involved here, it's really quite beautiful. Um, and what will happen? I, I'm kind of living in a fiction right now because I'm living in this suspended period where there are 150, Zarmina, my translator's husband's family, is waiting for the plane right now. There are 34 people in that family. He's a judge. He has been sending the Taliban to prison for 20 years on this hope that we built of a civil society that's a complete fiction. So my husband, who writes about these national security much more than I do, um, he's, he wrote a book called Ghost Wars and another one called Directorate S. Um, we have a debate about this. He's like, well, what, should we not have tried to help people for two days? Should Zarmina never have had a promise of being a journalist then? Would that have been? So there's so many unanswered questions here. Um, and I am not looking to answer any questions. I'm just looking to save. I thought I'm looking to help Afghans save their own lives um, because we have failed them to a scale that is unimaginable and we have failed above all, we have failed our veterans because they died for this. They died to make this country a better place. So I'm gonna share a couple of these poems to kind of ground myself and then open, open up to any questions that you might have. Um, I mean, I, I just gave you like a teacup of what sort of, I mean, this has been like. Um, and it's ongoing, and I have tons of ideas about how you guys can be involved, um, mostly around resettlement, because these Afghans are gonna be coming to your communities, and nobody does more for refugees than communities of faith, right? And they are going to need everything. And the people who are coming are not really villagers, because villagers are kind of okay under the Taliban. They're low profile enough. The people who are coming are university professors, the ministers of education, judges, journalists, artists, filmmakers, like the, the elite. And I have had my friends among these group on the phone screaming at me from Doha, from Germany, because they're like, what have you put us into? We are stateless. We have nothing now. That is the choice that people, people are aware right now. If people are leaving Afghanistan right now, they are giving up an upper middle class lifestyle to an upper class lifestyle to try to save their lives by leaving everything behind. So just like today, I started talking about one of the, one of the sort of ways in which I started to kind of not care about how I was different from other people or what I, if my beliefs were different was understanding that the taxi drivers in New York City, if they came from Cameroon, had probably very recently survived extraordinary torture levels. So every time I got into a taxi and was like, go faster, get through the traffic, that person I was ordering around had been through, if he, had, if he or she had gotten asylum, that they were Cameroonian and they'd come in the past couple of years, it meant they'd come through political asylum, which meant they'd survived a kind of torture that is unbelievable. And that understanding, as we talked about today a little bit, it's as if, you know, when something unbelievably horrifying has happened in your life, mostly for me, that would be an experience of grief, you know, losing somebody. And you walk down the street and there's that first feeling of nobody knows what I've been through. Nobody knows what I've been through. And super quickly that drops away and it's like, and I don't know what anybody else has been through either. And what if they too have lost their mom today? And I'm there demanding that I, my coffee comes faster or I brush them in the, because I am not understanding that, that what I don't know. So I think I sort of will leave that the talking part on that and then read a couple of poems, but like that's how can I, as a human, slow down and occupy that level of like humanness more? That for me is, is what I am trying to work on. Okay, so now I'm gonna read you a couple of these crazy poems. 
and I'm gonna read you one with a really bad word on it to try to bring some levity into this extremely heavy experience, okay? I'm not gonna F-bomb in the church because I can't do that. That's, but I'm gonna, I'll, I'll bleep it out, but okay. So, and I, I can't look at Tim right now because I know he knows exactly what I'm about to say and it's just too, okay. So my favorite and the most beautiful of these little poems, which is again, they're millennia old, goes like this. When sisters sit together, they're always praising their brothers. When brothers sit together, they're selling their sisters to others. So that one, that, that is really the most beautiful of them. Um, but I decided to collect them because I'd heard, I heard, heard one said, it was a, again, USAID, it was our, let's do it guys. You stop growing opium and you start growing tomatoes. And on the board in this like vegetation, that's not what you call it, agricultural seminar, there was like fictions on a whiteboard written of such, ex like if you eat 10 kilograms of tomatoes a day, you'll never get cancer. Okay, like just like crazy, in English, crazy fictions, right? So I was like, all right, whatever grant donor is here is, really getting sold a bill of goods. Anyway, so these women were all there to learn, to not grow poppy, anything but poppy, anything but opium. And I ask if any of them know these poems, because I'm starting to think, do they know them? How present are these land days in their life? And a woman gets up and she says something. She pulls her burqa back and she puts her hands and she says something. I don't speak Pashto. I can read a little bit now, but I couldn't understand a word she said. And my sweet, the women in the room go, <gasps> and look, break, break out in laughter. And my sweet, maybe 22-year-old virgin translator at the time, it was another woman, not Zermina, was so ashen white. But I turned to her and I was like, Asma, what did she say? She's like, it really, it doesn't make any sense. And I was like, no, it definitely makes sense because 400 people just laughed, okay? And she's like, it does not make sense. And I was like, okay, all right. I was like, just write it down. We'll come back to it later. She wrote it down. Later that evening, so no Afghan woman can, tra can travel on her own. Zarmina can, because Zarmina doesn't have a man as a mera, as a guide. Um, but, <laughs> but Asma did. She had to travel with her Uncle Safi. So everywhere Asma, I took Asma, Uncle Safi with his AK-47 came along, right? So that night we're sitting in a fortified, you know, under siege in this little area that's Taliban control. Um, and I pull out the poem and I'm like, okay, Asma, I mean, what, what is this? And she's like, I told you, it doesn't make any sense. It's about corn. It's about corn and fungus. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. And her uncle doesn't speak very much English, but he understood exactly what was going on. He said, give me your paper. You took my notebook, okay? And he said, this is a healthy kind of corn that a woman likes. Erect, healthy corn. This poem is about this kind of facile, diseased, old corn. And I was like, I get it. And he's like, mm-hmm. And Asma was like, I still don't understand. I was like, no problem. And what this woman had said is, I'm trying to think, let me just think how to, m making love to an old man is like having intercourse with a withered corn stalk blackened by fungus, okay? This is a woman, maybe 19 years old, maybe 20, a third wife herself, right? And that was another of those moments where like, oh, I'm gonna say, like the woman under the burqa is meek and like, oh, she, uh, hells no, right? So she is there and she, okay, so let's end with a symbol of resilience. Gulmakai, that's her name. There's no way Gulmakai is wanted by the Taliban. Gulmakai is out there farming now, right? She just didn't have the opportunity. The fiction that we liberated Afghanistan and every woman was, you know, in a miniskirt is a fiction, right? In most of Afghanistan's provinces, women were still illiterate um, and not going to school. Gulmakai is out there with that poem in her head today, right? She's gonna be okay. So. Can we, can I, live in the unknowing that I wouldn't have known what was gonna happen two weeks ago, a year ago? Could it be that somehow 
there's, I can't even, there's more in store, and we don't know what it is, right? I don't know God's will for Gulmakai, right? But I, that mouth is certainly extraordinary and unexpected. So, all right, I think that's the nicest. Those are the, that's the best poem, the prettiest poem, and the naughtiest poem. I think that's plenty. Um, with that, I'm going to open up for some questions and ask, how can I, how, how can I help you? <laughs> ask me anything you want, right? Um, okay, I see a microphone coming around. How long was that? That was not, it's long, 45 minutes? Okay, I'm sorry. I really tried not to hold you guys hostage. I, okay, five questions? Five minutes of questions. It's 8.02, so if you, and if you have to go, I never take umbrage at all. Just get, I have an eight-year-old and I have to leave early all the time, so please get up and go and I'm not gonna be offended if you need to. But I will be offended if nobody asks a question, so hop to it. <laughs> Thank you so much. How timely to have a, it's just wonderful to be, be at the foot of a journalist like you. So how do you write the 10th parallel and you can write Amity and Prosperity? I mean, I've, I've started both of the books. My local library had them, which makes me very proud of my little hometown library. And um, it's, it's hard for me to understand and relate to the 10th parallel, but I'm trying. Yeah. My heart goes out to the people in Amity and Prosperity. How can a woman like you write those two stories, jump from those two worlds? Thank you. Um, so one of the, the first book is, you know, 9,000 miles in two continents in seven years, so it's far away. Because of the obligation of being an American. Because I'd spent most of my career in war zones looking at the problems of other societies without looking at our own. And that, my commitment after finishing that 10th parallel was to come back to the United States and look at exactly the same dynamics of the resource curse. Why is it that people who live on land richest in natural resources are some of the poorest? That's true in Nigeria and it's true in Appalachia. So that's what I, that's what I said. That's the question I set out to answer, but it was really the idea that that kind of enough looking abroad, let's look within. Yeah. Uh, I came, I, I saw the piece in the paper about this and said the presentation <clears throat> will focus on exploring how and whether Americans of faith can engage in conversations in a world that is religiously and politically divided. Do you have any comments or have suggestions on how and whether that can be done? I would say if you heard this talk and don't think that it addressed how people of faith can show up in divided spaces, I don't have much more to say. Yeah. Were you surprised at the suddenness of what happened, or did you anticipate that it would happen in this way, that things would just disintegrate as we left? Totally shocked. I don't get it. Totally shocked. Could be that I wasn't paying enough attention. I think you were. <laughs> you know, totally shocked. I mean, the speed with which we had to, like, Zarmina and Gulistan's families, shocking. I don't get it. One more question? Yeah. My question concerns the encounters between those who were threatened and the, those who were doing the threatening on their journey out of the country. Were there encounters? Were these encounters violent? Were they nonviolent? And which were successful? I'm afraid I'm just a little bit confused. Like, so you mean getting people out of the country, they, they were threatened? By there, there had to be encounters. So, on the trip from their homes to the airport, they would have to pass through certain Taliban checkpoints. Now, Taliban's in control now. Now they're in full control of the airport also, right? But at that time, well, the 
Qataris are sort of in, it's a, it, the airport is a question. So like some of their, them were not very threatening. Like they'd show, the people would gather to get on the buses and the Taliban would come by and say, where are you going? And they'd say, a wedding. And the Taliban would wander away. Okay, like that's an encounter, not so threatening, right? The closer they got to the airport and depending on the hour and the day, the person they encountered, like sometimes they, mostly it was the drivers. None of the people we were transporting were beaten by the Taliban, um, but the drivers were on a pretty regular basis. So we didn't have anybody shot and killed either, but we did, we were at the gate when that suicide bomber went off. Um, we just were not close enough that we lost anybody. But those Afghans who were killed, I think we're at 120 now, were people just like the people we were moving trying to get inside the airport. So all nature of threat, all nature of violence. Is that helpful? Um, do you think that uh, nonviolence would work in Afghanistan? Does nonviolence work in America? I believe it does. Um, I love that you do, and I think that's the hope. I mean, how can we do anything other than, than try to bring the best of ourselves into the world and bring out the best in others? Well, it's an individual choice. Individual choice has gotten to us a place where we need to have collective action on a couple of things. Individualism is falling apart on the left and the right here. That's something sometimes I give whole talks about because that's part of the problem. America's concept of its individualism has gotten us into a lot of hot water, whether that's like, I recycle so I'm better, or I believe X or Y. So I think with this, I'd like to say thank you guys so much for listening, um, and thank you so much for coming, and thanks again to Tim and Kathleen. I do want to uh, say thank you to Eliza, and I did, I, I chased after one of the gentlemen uh, who asked a little bit about our topic as we publicized it, and to speak personally um, about how what Eliza has shared fulfills how we build this. It isn't exactly what we all thought we were doing, but one of the things, well, um, one of the things that I really learned in hearing her, that the clergy of our diocese got to have a conversation this afternoon. And in thinking about uh, issues where we have very different worldviews, we were talking about how, well, how do we speak into that with people who see things very differently and things that are hugely important. And um, Eliza shared with great humility, both tonight and in there, um, about how these things of trauma just make you understand your own humanity and not go to others and assume you know. And that as a journalist, she does this reporting of reality. And, and how did you say it? Getting, uh, the Amity and Prosperity book she said you, you kind of knocked on the door of a van and got in with the family for seven years. You know, she kind of walked with them. And I experienced that tonight, that I could not go to Afghanistan. And as I read the papers and as a bishop try to think, how do I preach on my biblical texts and this that's going on? I'm deeply helped by Eliza Griswold sharing in detail as a journalist the realities. And so I, I hope that you take um, something away from this opportunity that seems kind of historic for me, that we had no idea uh, when we booked this seven, eight months ago 
that her experiences in Afghanistan would be so relevant uh, for all of us. But I want to thank her for her eloqu eloquence and passion and thank all of you for coming tonight. And I, I pray that you also will take something away that helps you uh, speak uh, into complex issues and do it with the kind of hope that she brings to us. So thank you so much. If you would like.